Welcome to part four of the series on what did you do in the Cold War day. In the last part, we had just lost contact with the targets. The buggers had disappeared. But this is not so unusual. It's quite often the case that contacts would appear and then mysteriously disappear. One has to remember that the area we covered was vast. It extended from the Shetland Islands, northwards towards the Faroes, then up to Iceland, northeastwards across to the northern tip of Norway. This, in our terms, is only a stone's throw from the Soviet bases at Murmansk and Archangel, literally just round the corner. It's also quite easy to forget that our friends in Norway share a common border with Russia, which then, of course, the Soviet Union. We duly arrived on our designated combat air patrol position. Dick had put the latitude and longitude into the NAV computer. The NAV computer which gave an approximation of our position. Not for this ex-Royal Navy machine, the luxury of a very accurate, even by today's standards, inertial navigation system. Astonishingly so, uh, despite its analogue technology. The Phantoms that were ordered for the Royal Air Force had inertial nav, or INS, fitted as standard. Still, the less than accurate air data computing system was better than nothing. I looked at the fuel gauge. We had enough aviation turbine, or AVTUR, to stooge around for another 90 minutes or so before we would have to head off south back towards our base at Lucas or a diversion possibly to Lossy Mouth or Sumbra at the southern end of the Shetland Islands. But better still, we could hope to find our tanker still on the tow line. And around and around we went. A couple of minutes straight and level, followed by a 40 degree angle of bank turn, and so on ad nauseum. The sun had long since disappeared, and the gloom of the night sky enveloped us and its embrace. Something made me look up through the Perspex canopy. It was stars as I had never seen them before. I was looking at what can be best described as a huge theatre curtain made up of thousands of tiny dots of light waving and rippling, a curtain that extended laterally and vertically as far as my eye could see. The whole universe was alive and flowing with a seemingly controlled energy that at the same time was dignified and majestic. Of course, Dick knew the answer. Aurora Borealis, except back on terra firma, we see it as the Northern Light Show. It was mesmerising. I was suddenly mightily glad there were two of us witnessing this magnificent spectacle from our comfort of our cockpit. I had heard stories referring to out-of-body experiences under such external stimuli when more than one pilot, alone in the single-seat lightning, which was our predecessor, had found it quite disconcerting to find himself outside of his cockpit looking in at himself, all at 25,000 feet in the middle of absolutely nowhere, both in time and space. The combat air patrol continued. Round and round we droned, perched somewhere equidistant from the Faroes, Shetland and Bodo in northern Norway. Bodo, the Norwegian F-16 base, a place where the sun never sets in high summer of June, but barely gets a glimmer of daylight, gloomy daylight at that in winter. The fuel gauge with its mix of tape and digital numbers moved downwards and inexorably to the left. As the fuel continued to feed the two Rolls-Royce Spey turbine engines, murmuring gently along below and behind us. I often thought that Rolls had done a particularly good job on the Spey. They had taken a bypass jet engine designed to spend its life running at a nice, steady 85% RPM, purring along in straight lines around Europe, propelling sedate transport aeroplanes along at leisurely pace. Instead, they took this engine, fed neat jet fuel behind it into the jet pipe exhaust, for good measure tossed in a lighted match, 
stood back while the whole lot lit off with a bang and a roar and a whoomph of raw power. Not only that, but then the company had to contend with the fact they were told by the senior military, oh, by the way, we're going to park the throttles in the top left-hand corner and leave them there at 100% RPM for as long as it takes. Of course, Rolls were furious. But the engine, after many teething troubles, was rectified and eventually would run for a thousand hours between overhaul. The fuel had now reached decision time. I asked it, got a heading for the tow line? South, came the inspired reply. Saxo, vectors for the tow line, please. Ah, came the cryptic response. He, the controller, went on to explain that the VC-10 had gone home and his replacement was just north of Lossiemouth, estimating on the tow line in around 30 minutes. That bit of information got the adrenaline flow going. Dick did some mental quick, mental gymnastics and came up with not good.